out, hopefully figure out where the uh, class is being held today. And I'm glad to see you all here. So actually, the first thing I wanted to do was um, talk a little bit about the class makeup, because um, we're going to have a little shift of plans here. Um, we, as, we, as I mentioned before, the class is a very diverse group um, based on the uh, survey. Thank you very much for filling it out, those of you who did. I think most people did. Um, we have about 10 computer science grad students, um, 13 grad students from other application areas. Uh, the biggest group is uh, from nuclear. And um, then about seven undergraduates, mostly CS, although there's not, not clear for everybody. And then some people that are enrolled through concurrent or enrollment that we can't really predict either exactly where they're from. But we know some of them are also from uh, various application domains. So, um, you know, as I said before, everyone is going to be an expert in a different part of the course. And um, some of the <laughs> lectures that we've had, so the first lecture was very broad, kind of trying to give you an overview. Um, the second lecture went very deep down into the details of computer architecture, which I realized for some of you was um, not at all very familiar material. And so we'll, we will have um, a, a sort of mixture of different lectures uh, styles in terms of whether they're kind of broad or deep on a particular topic, um, mostly focusing on certain topics that are we think are important for um, the, the um, projects that you're going to do, the homework assignments in that case, or um, or things that we think there's, that you might need in um, your, uh, your other research activities in computation. So uh, what, one of the things that we're going to do is to actually reorder lectures four and five with lectures six and seven relative to what was posted. That means that um, on Thursday, Jim is going to be giving a lecture. So that's another advantage, giving him a chance to talk and me a break. Um, he's going to talk about par sources of parallelism for two lectures. And then, um, then we'll go and do more details about parallel programming. So um, we decided that with a little overview, so today's lecture is going to be pretty broad, kind of overview of parallel architectures to hopefully just get you thinking about what you need to do to write a parallel application, but not giving you the mechanics to do it. Um, and from that, then he'll talk about applications and where parallelism comes from in a lot of those different applications. And by the way, parallelism and locality, because it turns out that, um, as we've been saying, locality is at least as important as parallelism in uh, getting, getting these things to work well. And then um, today, because last, week, last week's uh, lecture, and I apologize, got really rushed at the end, uh, Jim and I realized in going back and looking at it, that was because the last time it was given, part of that lecture was given in the next day. So I'm going to go back and do some of the pragmatics of um, tuning, how you tune code in practice, which I think are important for people to know. There again, for people who've, who've done some of this in um, undergraduate courses, in a computer science course, this may be um, somewhat a review, of, especially if you're knowledgeable about compilers and things like that, or architectures. But for, um, but it'll, I think for everybody, we wanted to just make sure you have some understanding of how you get performance out of serial code. So we'll start with that, and then I'll t give the overview of parallel machines. So if people um, uh, who are, uh, for example, remote are looking at lectures <coughs> online, I'm actually going to skip to the lecture notes number two and start with, um, I'm going to have one kind of reminder, review slide, which is from earlier in the lecture, and then I'll go to what was lecture uh, slide 66 um, before. So I just inserted this one in. So we talked about this before in terms of how to optimize matrix multiply. So the way to think about optimizing matrix multiply because of the memory hierarchy is with a hierarchical algorithm. So it is a, called a blocked or tiled algorithm. And so what we really what we have here is we're going to be doing matrix multiply on little blocks. Okay. So um, that hopefully the, and the idea is that in remembering your fast memory hierarchy, um, you have a little bit of space. You can't fit your entire all of your matrices into into them. But what you'll do is you'll load a block of C a little block of A and a little block of B into your caches. And hopefully the hardware will do that for you if you write the code in such a way that it's accessing those blocks. And um, once they're loaded into cache, you can use them over and over again. So as you're doing matrix multiply, these, um, the rows of A and, and um, columns of B are going to be used multiple times in order to compute each one of the elements of C. So the idea is you load these three blocks into the cache. It may take a little while for them all to get loaded as you're running the first kind of a set of um, iterations of your loop. But once they sit in there, then the next accesses will be very fast. So the first you know, kind of a set of, uh, let's say, the, f the first uh, row or, or whatever of C that may be a little bit slower. As you access different elements, they get pulled into the cache. But once they're in there, um, they'll be very fast, and you'll get to reuse them. So it's really to improve your temporal locality, your, that is, your reuse of the data, is to, make it, um, to write it in this blocked fa fashion. So what does it actually mean uh, to write a code in this block fashion for matrix multiply. It may be completely obvious to you, but just in case, um, to make it hopefully a little bit more clear. So we started out with a code that the program that was just um, three nested loops, i, j, and k. And here was our original assignment statement, except now we're saying, we'll think of this as 
a matrix multiply. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this assignment statement here now becomes three nested loops, right? Which have, and just kind of a convention at least we've used locally is we'll use three more indices for running through those, those little tiny arrays, which are ii, jj, and kk. Those are just variable names, by the way. Maybe not the best ones, but they're the block indices that we're going to run through these little tiny blocks. So we take matrix multiply that was three nested loops, right, just an I, a J, and a K loop with one assignment statement in it. We turn it into one that has six loops all nested within each other with, again, one assignment statement for the one um, value of CIJ. And, um, and, we, uh, and that's how we end up blocking the code. You can block from multiple levels. So there, you may write matrix multiply with nine nested loops. For example, you decide that there's a level Three to two cache that's off chip, so you want something that's a little bit larger, brings everything into that. And then you have a level of um, blocking that's maybe just for either for a higher level of cache or um, a lot of times you'll do register blocking. So remember, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, that the values are getting loaded and loaded into registers. And there's a very small set of registers that you can access. So if you have a little tiny block, you can actually load all those values into registers. They're going to be at different, and, the, and, the, and what will happen is you'll just write a little tiny matrix multiply that operates on those values um, that, that might be something like a three by three matrix multiply that is all sitting inside of the registers, which is the fastest memory in the system. So that's, um, and, and by the way, when you do that register blocking, we're going to have to write the code a little bit differently. We may not write it as um, three nested loops unless we think the compiler will do a good job of, of um, generating code for that. We'll talk about one of the optimizations. Questions? Yes? Um, so anything that is, it's, is larger than um, your cache, so uh, which would be, I mean, typically, let's see, we had that one graph, so I'm trying to remember if I can just back up to it here. Um, there was one. So there you can see, and so there's a matrix of size um, 200 by 200, and there's 300 by 300, and you can see performance falling off because at that point it's fallen out of the cache. So, um, and this is that's sort of separate from the register blocking. What you're doing in register blocking is when you've you've gotten everything. So you, let's say you've added two levels of nested loops, and your inner loops are small enough so that you can fit 200 by 200, so um, elements inside of your inside of your uh, cache, and so your inner loop is that way. And then, and then you want to try to see if you can get this performance to go a little bit higher, and so you'll write another matrix multiplied to try to boost that up as well. And, and what you're tr doing by blocking it is then trying to smooth this out, but you're worried about you know, matrices that are way down here. Can you make them run a little bit faster? Um, and you can see, I guess you can't really see little tiny matrices going fast here, but you will find that you can, you can make them. Um, very small ones uh, go fast. This code has already been optimized to make the small matrices go fast. But so that, just to give you kind of an order of magnitude, that's probably what it is. Any other questions? Is it clear what it means to block the code now? Okay. And, and in general, that's what it means to, to tie. We, we use the word tile and block, and uh, the, it's a little confusing. We use both terminology. The original term was blocking the code because you're organizing into blocks. Um, unfortunately, the word block gets used in a lot of other areas of computer science, and so then people started using the word tile, which is not, has not been as uh, overused as the word block has. But anyway, that's, that's the idea is you're adding an extra level of nesting and then solving a subproblem that's smaller that, on, on a piece of data that fits into your, um, into your fast memory. Okay, so in practice, that's a little bit of the practice. Um, the, there's a big question about, well, what's the size? How, make, how, do, how, how large do you make that block size? And, um, and in addition to blocking, there's a lot of other things you can do to write the code a little bit differently. So for example, in, um, if you're programming in C, you can, use, um, you can either write things with array notation or you can write things with pointer notation. Um, in, um, and you can put in function calls in places. You can write loops in different orders. And you'll still get um, a program that works correctly, especially matrix multiply is very, there's a lot of different variations that all give you the right answer. So, um, and this is even separate from things like Strassen's algorithm. So just looking at the kind of conventional algorithm, uh, there's a lot of variations. So, um, and it's very hard to predict exactly how those different variations are going to run. So um, what, the re what we have done here in the research projects in, the compu in computer science is to develop this idea of auto-tuning. And um, so just think about that six-nested loop version of matrix multiply. One of the questions is, 
um, how, what, what is that inner loop bound? What's the, what, what are the II, JJ, and KK, what do they go up to? Because you want to have something that fits inside of cache. And so you can go look at your hardware manuals, try to figure out how big IJ and K, I mean, how, how big the matrices are that would fit, make your, set your loop bounds that way. But the truth is that you may not know which cache level you should actually block for. Should you block for everyone? Should you block for just one? Um, how is the associativity in that cache actually going to um, affect what's sitting in the cache? So it becomes very complicated to just look at the hardware manual and figure out how to optimize it. Plus, do you really want to go off and read the hardware manual? So um, things like cache sizes tend to be very um, difficult information to get because it's not really exposed to you as a programmer. So. The idea was to generate a lot of different versions of the code and then search over them. That is to run all of these different versions of matrix multiply. And if you have a small kernel that is a little computation that you're going to do over and over again, it can be really important to, to um, really optimize that code well. And so this is a technique that was used for, thing, for libraries like these BLAS libraries that I talked about, the basic linear algebra libraries, um, to go ahead and generate a lot of different versions of the code and, um, and run them, as opposed to having, in some case, um, multiple man years of effort go into hand, hand optimizing these codes. So this field of auto-tuning started in this class. Um, and it was in the mid-1990s, um, and a graduate student in the class, a couple of graduate students in the class, one of them is named Krista Osanovich, who, uh, um, and the other one was Jeff Vilms, I believe, both of whom, one's in the faculty of the University of Washington, and one is um, on the faculty here, after having spent a few years at MIT. But anyway, um, they built a project with Jim called FEPAC, which stood for Portable High Performance um, C, and it, that led to another project at the University of Tennessee called ATLAS, and that has been used in MATLAB, that, that used this idea. And what happened was uh, the first matrix multiply assignment we gave, there was, actually there was another graduate student, I think, in that team, Ken Stanley, who said, well, I don't know which order to put these instructions. I'm just going to generate all the versions for this little tiny matrix multiply that was sitting in the registers, just generate them all and run them to see, see which is the fastest. And that became, that kind of led to this idea of auto-tuning. There are now many researchers at universities using auto-tuning ideas and to other kinds of um, computational patterns and so on. So um, we still need to understand something about how to do optimizations by hand because if you're going to write an auto-tuner, you need to know what, what optimizations to put into it. Um, so now to think about what an auto-tuner is, it is you're writing a program that's, that's spitting out you know, three nested loops or six nested loops and figuring out what that inner loop bound is, so setting a value for that inner loop bound, um, other things like that. So you're writing, uh, that's what we mean by a, uh, a code generator, um, which is part of this, uh, an auto-tuner. Okay, so the first thing that we've I've now talked about a few times is um, one of the things you want to do in practice is search over the block sizes, um, and this can be very, it can be very useful to use some kind of a performance model um, to help you figure out how, that, that is something that tells you, for example, how large the caches are and says, well, if you're running matrix multiply, you want to use one-third of your cache for C, one-third of your cache for A, and one-third for B. Um, but it turns out that these models have not proven very useful for um, block size selection in things like matrix multiply. Um, there's a few different papers on this, but it, it turns out that to have a, a model that's simple enough that um, you can actually really think about it very, and, and it helps you in writing code by hand, um, it tends to not be very accurate. Whereas if you make a very complicated model that says, well, there's really three levels of cache, and there's this many registers, and there, the associativity level in the caches, and so on, it becomes so p complicated that you are better off just running the code on the hardware. Yes, Jim. Right. So one of the things that we do in audit, so, so you'll find that the search space becomes very large and takes a long time. So it might take, um, for example, a day or so to run all the possible versions of something if you're not smart about narrowing it down to the ones that are the most, um, most likely to be in interesting. OK, so what does this search space look like in practice? So this is what we call a heat map in the Bebop project, which is an auto-tuning project here that Jim and I have been running for a number of years. And um, this, is the, this is looking at register blocking. OK, so what we're varying here is the size, the, the dimension of that, the, um, of that innermost loop. And so you can see there's little tiny matrices that we're looking at. This is a larger matrix multiply, but we're looking at um, how big should that inner loop be. If we make the inner loop too large, then things fall. They no longer fit in the registers, so you don't get reuse in the registers. What you want to do is have a little tiny block that's just, um, just big enough to fill up all the registers, which gives you as much reuse as possible, um, but not so big that it that it's falls out of the registers. And the, 
so this is the number of columns in the register block, the number of rows in the register block, and so you see they're relatively small values here. And um, what the color shows you is um, how fast this goes. So this is a megaflop rate. Um, this is a relatively old machine. That's why the megaflop rates um, look a little bit, bit uh, low. I think this is a Sun UltraSpark 2i. But um, what's really interesting about this is that this red square right there, um, that's the optimal point. The size is um, is a four by, I think it's four by two. That's uh, it. Nah, I think it's is it by three? Yeah, maybe it is by three. I think we might be um, two by three. And um, the uh, the the interesting thing is that if you're a little bit off in one direction or another, you can get really bad performance. So it's not as though it's a nice smooth heat map where around this dark red squares are lots of little squares that are close to that red. Um, if you go in the wrong direction off of that heat map, you'll, you'll really get very, very bad performance. Uh, why isn't the heat map exactly symmetrical about the line lines? Good, good question. Well, um, so the, um, although, the, although you think of the matrix, these, the, this was a square matrix problem, and these blocks we can um, are square. The, the layout in memory is different, right, for a row and a column. So a row is going to be laid out contiguously in memory. Oh, sorry, this was C code, yes. So a row is going to be um, laid out contiguously, and a column is not going to be laid out contiguously. So exactly how that gets loaded into the registers is going to be different depending on whether it's a row or a column. And so that, that, for that reason, you may want, typically, you want um, longer, you want, a, you want longer r rows, and so you have more, more columns in your register block because you're un running in a unit stride direction, which is giving you better cache utilization. So, but that's a good question, yes. Um, okay, a good question, and um, that was actually, this was kind of one of the motivations for the project OSCE. So the heat map for sparse matrices is going to be specific to a, a sparse matrix. Um, a particular instance of a sparse matrix because a matrix that's used for something like um, modeling of a you know, structure is going to be very different than a matrix that comes from Google um, page ranking algorithms and things like that. And so they will be, um, they, they'll have even less structure to it than this. And what, what we'll find, and Jim will talk about, or one of us will talk about this in a few weeks when we talk about optimizing sparse matrices, is we'll use information about how the dense matrix performs to try to, to figure out how to narrow the search space down for sparse matrices. Did you have another comment, Jim? Okay, so let's see. I think I, I showed this slide very briefly last time as I was trying to whiz through to finish up the lecture. But anyway, this was the um, performance for hand-optimized versus auto-tuned um, blahs versus uh, kind of the, the thing that you get from three nested loops written in Fortran 77. And so you can see that. Um, and by the way, these vendor-optimized blahs, these are optimized by a team of scientific researchers um, that sit in, uh, inside of these companies and understand hardware, uh, kind of low-level hardware compilers and algorithm, numerical algorithms enough to do this kind of hand optimization. So you can see that the auto-tune performance is basically dead even with the uh, hand-tuned. Yeah, so, so there's all kinds of weird stuff. And one of the reasons that we show you graph, some, some of these graphs are from old machines is partly because. Yeah, they're all been scalar machines. Right. And some of that's because, they're, uh, because we have, have these beautifully gra beautiful graphs that we analyzed a few years ago. And part of it is because, like when we were doing those memory graphs, they become so complicated on today's modern machines. What that means is that it's even harder to build a performance model and you just need to search. So sometimes you won't see as much structure. Um, but you will see that auto-tuning is kind of standard. In fact, the, some of the vendors will, um, they, they still have a, a team that may do some hand-tuning of these Blas libraries, but they'll pick up the thing that comes out of Atlas and then see if they can add a little bit more secret sauce to it. Jim. <coughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> right. OK. So optimizations in practice. So um, one of the things that um, you do in practice, as I said, is you want to tile for the registers. So you want to have things that, are, that, that live inside the registers. When, because uh, the registers actually have different names for each other, um, and you want the compiler to generate code for that, you typically will unroll the loop. That is, if you've decided you want a little 2 by 2 matrix multiply, well, what does that require? It requires four assignment statements in there, 
for, to fill in each one of the elements of the C matrix for the 4x4 four four, um, matrix block. And you can just write those four assignment statements down for the 2x2 two two matrix multiply. And you can do the same thing for a larger, um, a, a larger sub-block. I mean, you saw on that previous slide that we tried things up to 16 by 16, although the, the better sizes were um, things like you know, in the 2x3 or 2x4 or or range. But um, you will, you, you, you will unroll it then so that it, because all these things will just be loaded into different registers, and each assignment statement will use different register values. Um, you can also try to play with making up temporary variable names, um, which will basically correspond to the name of the registers. Um, if you're programming in C, there actually is a register keyword, a register hint. For the most part, compilers tend to ignore that hint, but um, there, there was support in the language originally for people to help optimize for register use. So you kind of you unroll it, and you hope the compiler will do a good job of putting each one of your variables into a different register and then leaving it there because your four assignment statements or your, um, you know, your, your six assignment statements or whatever you have in there are all going to be using those variables multiple times. Um, they will, so most compilers will do some kind of sophisticated scheduling. Like, yeah, yeah, they will do, and, and whether they will, um, I mean, the interesting thing will be if you unroll your code, um, what will the compiler do? And sometimes what we'll find is code that gets unrolled too much will cause the compiler to say, I have no idea how to schedule this, and it'll, the performance will really degrade for that reason. So it'll be, you're unrolling it by hand versus telling it to unroll. You can do, you you can do both, so there will be compiler flags, and one of the things that people have run into in the past is they'll, they'll say, I, I asked the compiler to, uh, I, um, I hand unrolled it twice, and then, then I couldn't get the compiler to not unroll it two more. So mm -hmm. it's got heuristics, and it'll sometimes, you know, part of what you're doing is trying to coax the compiler to generate the code you want. So you, you have, it's, it's pretty much of a black box, and it's hard to tell, except by looking at the performance that comes out or reading the assembly code, what it's done. Um, so you want to, might want to tile from multiple levels, so the cache, even the TLB, which, as I said, is you can kind of think of as a, as a cache. It's really a cache um, having to do with a virtual memory system, but for the purposes of this optimization, just think of it as another level of nested loop. Um, you, if you have a really big matrix, you might want to exploit some kind of fine-grained parallelism. So this is so things like superscalar and pipelining. That might come from rearranging your assignment statements in a certain way um, in order to try to encourage the compiler to generate the best code. And that was actually this first exercise I mentioned um, that, that somebody did when they had enrolled their inner loop. Then they said, well, which order do I want the assignment statements in? I'll just try all possible combinations of orders, run each of them, and figure out which one's the fastest. Um, you may, in, we talked about the complicated compiler inter interactions, and um, you're going to be doing this by hand, but it is, it is difficult. Here's just some pointers to um, a number of different uh, local projects. The first three of them are, are all Berkeley projects on auto-tuning. The Atlas project is at, it, that is at the University of Tennessee. Um, there's also auto-tuning projects now at a number of other universities, University of Utah, University of Maryland, I think Stanford, um, and others. OK, so a couple of other things you may want to do. Um, you might want to um, remove false dependencies. So a dependence is, um, is in the, when you have assignment statements, if you have one um, assignment statement that is reading or writing a value and then another one that is going to read or write the value, if, if at least one of those two is a write, then you have what's called a dependence because you can't reorder them. And in some cases, um, there may be a false dependence between, for example, in this case, between A of I and B of I plus one. So what, what does that mean? That means that the compiler can't tell that A of I and B of I plus 1 are not the same variable. Because in C, you can alias things, you can have pointers into things, and so on, and they could actually be the same. So you might rewrite this code to make up new scalar variables. They can't refer to anything else. They're just a simple floating point variable, that's, and they might get stored in a register. Um, but also then, you'll avoid using these names that the compiler gets confused about. So you'll want to sometimes use simpler names, uh, simpler variables. And there's also. Um, there are ways in compilers that you can also declare that the A and B arrays are unaliased. Um, there's things called restrict pointers in C, um, which you can, there are compiler flags or pragmas, so one of the things you, may wa you will want to do in ho the homework is to kind of look at the compiler options and see if there are some things that you could use um, to try to get it to go faster. Um, you also may want to um, make sure that you're using multiple registers. So if you have um, this program that is, it has got a, a little loop here and it's got these different, um, these different expressions with, that are all um, 
accessing different array values. You can make up these temporary names, F0, F1, and F2. Use those in the assignment statements, because inside of this loop, um, it's going to use each of these values um, over and over again. Okay, this assumes the filter doesn't change. And so this is a way of um, kind of trying to encourage the compiler to store those values in a register. And, um, and hopefully a smart compiler might just do this for you in this code, so you may get no benefit from doing this, but some compilers might not for whatever reason. It can't understand whether, whether the filter array is being changed in the middle of the loop iteration, and so um, that's, it's another thing that you can try. Um, loop unrolling, well, that's, I talked about that before, but basically the idea is if you've got some kind of a loop like this, you might want to just um, unroll it into a, um, a set of, uh, or sorry, you expo you, you've already you've unrolled the loop so that you get um, these different uh, assignment statements, and this will give you sometimes instruction level parallelism um, that the low level hardware will, will exploit. Um, making sure that they, there are independent operations, so you can make up these temporary variables, which is kind of like um, removing the uh, dependencies between things, but um, also balancing the instruction mix. So in some cases, for example, if you, um, uh, hardware, as I mentioned before, may have a multiply and add instruction. I think I mentioned that in the first lecture, but anyway, the, a, lot of hard, a lot of processors have a special instruction for doing a multiply followed immediately by an add because it's so common in a lot of code. And so if you organize things in a certain way, the compiler may turn that into one of these fast multiply add instructions that can be done at twice the speed of a single, a separate multiply and a separate add. Copy optimizations is what Jim talked about earlier. So um, this is important for alignment. So what happens is we talked about the cache, caches and the structure of memory. So imagine your matrix is laid out in memory in such a way that you know a piece of it is in one cache line and another piece is another cache line. But actually, that that piece is the piece that you want to use for a register block. Um, so you may want to copy it before you do matrix multiply or um, you may want to copy the piece that you're going to use for a cache block to make sure it's all contiguous in memory because normally it would be you know, a subset of rows, for example, that don't go all the way to the end, so it's not a contiguous chunk of memory if it's a little um, block. So you can, this is changing the memory layout. Let's say that you started, this is Fortran code, so we've got a row major, a column major layout, sorry, and instead you reorganize the matrix like this um, so that it's stored in, um, in this, this block format. And you, and you do that by just picking up these, these elements and then, and then copying them into a little submatrix data structure. OK, so a lot of this is talked about matrix multiply, but I do want to emphasize that you can do these kinds of locality optimizations in other, um, in other applications. One of the reasons, though, that we use matrix multiply as the example is because um, it does have a very high computational intensity. That is, it's an order n cubed algorithm working on order n squared data. So you get up to a factor of n floating point operations per um, element if you organize the, the, um, the algorithm correctly. Uh, some other problems might only have a, con a small constant number of floating point operations per element. And so then the, you, you can still do the, the um, locality optimizations, but you may not see quite as much benefit. So this will kind of really highlight how much, um, how much benefit you get from locality optimizations. OK, so I think we did that. Any questions about, um, about, auto tu about tuning and by hand so that you're, you feel like you're kind of ready to do this in your homework assignment? Yes? Uh, will we be covering like SIMD instructions, or, or is that possible for locality um, Well, so, so, so SIMD instructions, I guess I talked a little bit about this in the architecture um, when I give, gave the overview of architecture, um, I'm not going to talk and lecture about exactly how to generate those instructions, but it will, but it will be one thing that you'll want to try with the compiler. And I think what I mentioned before is that there are intrinsics. There are ways in the compiler you can encourage it to do this, and you can also, if you want to, generate them by hand. Jim. Right. So for GPUs, which is a kind of a whole separate kind of SIMD-like they, they, would, they would not like us using that term, but there's, they're, they're data parallel, let's put it that way. Um, they will, we will have a whole lecture on it. But yeah, the SIMD instructions will be one thing you can kind of go and explore on your own in terms of how to do that. Any other questions? Okay. So, oops. Okay. I will pick up then with lecture three. And... Um, there's the class update for those of you who missed it, because I know people were still trying to find uh, a room for those of you who are not 
at uh, Berkeley, you may have noticed that the room looks very different today. That's because we were, we were not able to get our normal lecture room. But um, we have a very broad group of people. And we're going to start by talking about um, parallelism, sources of parallelism next time. Jim will give a lecture on the next two lectures on that. And you'll find also that he'll talk more about the algorithms part of the course in the middle of the semester. I'll talk more about machines and, and how to program them. OK, so high level overview of parallel machines. Um, just to give you a sense of when you want to think about mapping a, a, a computational problem onto a parallel machine, um, what does that machine look like? What does it mean to program it? So we're going to talk a little bit about shared memory, shared address based machines, mes message passing, data parallel. In some cases, we'll talk about both hardware models, how these machines get built, kind of what they look like, and also a little bit about how to program them. And we'll have a couple of more in-depth lectures on how to program them for at least a couple of these models um, later in the semester. So um, just a note that you can sometimes program something as if it's a message passing machine, even though the underlying hardware is shared memory. Or you can program something, in some cases, as a shared memory machine, even though it underlying um, hardware is, is not. It's got distributed memory um, structure. But, uh, and some of these work pretty well, and some of them don't work so well. But, but we will try, so I'll try to talk about both how you, um, how you program them and also um, what they look like. But historically, the, as the machines changed, the programming model changed with them. So this is one of the things that is really causing a lot of anxiety today, because we, we were building all of our high-performance machines for about 10 years out of clusters, basically of single processors or a small number of processors. And now with the number of cores growing, the width of these SIMD units, these little data parallel instructions, or those little vector instructions growing, um, we're it's not so clear how to program them anymore. OK. Cartoon of a parallel machine will make it more specific for the different types of machines we'll look at. Um, a machine is a bunch of processors. Um, and by the way, processor and core here I'm going to use interchangeably. I hate the word core, but uh, unfortunately the marketing people made it up so that they could say that the processors have got faster, even though what was really a processor is still the same speed um, when they put two cores on a chip. So, um, But anyway, we'll, we'll, we've got processors here. We've got memory here. And we've got some way of connecting them together. Okay, so very vague idea and lots of different questions about how you construct these machines. Is the memory physically, where is it located? How are they connected together? Can any processor talk to any other processor? Or do they have to ask, go through other processors to get there? And, so on. and then the programming models, um, well, I'll talk about um, the, how you create parallelism in the programming model a little bit. Um, we'll talk more about that when we talk about specific languages and models. Um, what kind of how are things ordered? What things can happen in any order because they're executing in parallel, and what things are guaranteed to happen in order? The data, what data is private to any one of these control threads, um, and what data is shared between them? And how do you um, how do you communicate data between them? Because if you can't communicate data between them, you can't really solve any kind of a interesting computation. Um, and how do you synchronize things? Um, a specific case of synchronization is, are there operations that are, what are the operations, the kind of the smallest operation on the machine that is indivisible, that no, even if things are happening in parallel, nobody can sort of see in the middle of that operation being updated? And finally, what does everything cost, which will tell us how we want to design algorithms? OK, well, you, as a simple running example, which is um, a, a, sum, a parallel sum example. Um, but to make it a little bit more interesting, before we compute the sum, we'll also apply a function to the array. So what we're doing is just computing the, uh, some function applied to all the elements of A and then summing up the elements. So graphically, um, we've got our array, which is input A. We compute another array, temporary array, if you want to think of it that way. Um, which is the f of a array. It may or may not exist in practice, but it's easiest to think of it that way. And then we add up all the elements in the f, of f a array into the sum s. So when we start talking about parallelizing them, there's a question about where does a live? Um, is it spread out? Is, does, is it all owned by one processor? Which, which processor is going to do which piece of the work? And um, how do they coordinate somehow to get a single answer down here? So hopefully, if you think about this, it's, it's pretty clear that the, this computation here can be done independently. Um, whatever processor is computing these things only needs these values of A's and doesn't need anything else. Um, but once you get to the sum, you have to coordinate. So in, the, in a shared memory programming model, um, which is the first one we'll talk about, there's, um, there's a set of threads of control 
that get created by, um, by, by um, spawning off work. You can think of it as a, a, a special kind of a function call in which that function call is going to happen in parallel with everything else. I think I might have a, some pseudo-syntax on the next slide. But, um, and then each uh, of the threads is going to have some variables that are private to it. Um, those of you who are familiar with the, the program stack, those, those are going to be the variables that are declared within the, um, in the function are going to be uh, typically going to be private to that thread. And um, there may also be some shared variables. These are things like in C, things are called uh, static variables. In, um, in Fortran, common blocks, um, or some kind of a heap in which you're allocating things. The heap tends to be, if you're doing a malloc, um, the, that data tends to be in a, a shared space. So you can, as, as long as other threads can get a pointer to the, the, the data, they can also see it. And in this model, there's no explicit communication. The communication is implicit because you're reading and writing to shared variables. And they, but they, they will need to sometimes synchronize, so they're going to coordinate by doing cer certain kinds of synchronization operations. So here's a little cartoon of what this looks like. Here's each one of our processors, which is going to really be a thread. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical processor. And there's some variables in here, like there's a local variable i. Each one of them has their own copy of i. Um, here's the array, maybe the array a, and also the, the output s, which they're all going to write into in order to compute the sum. Okay, so in the, um, the shared memory strategy, one of the, we still have to figure out what is each processor or thread going to do. And let, we'll make an assumption that the number of processors that we're working with is much smaller than the size of the array. It's an important uh, property to have in practice because it tends to be fairly expensive to create a thread relative to the operation of doing something like an add operation or if f is a simple function like square or something like that. Um, you need to have you need to have a, a chunk of work for any one of these threads to do. So we'll assume the number of processors is much smaller than the array size, and, um, and that it's each one of the, um, that, that it's attached to a single memory. So we're going to um, do a parallel decomposition, and so we'll al evaluate, um, and then we're going to do each, um, each evaluation of a partial sum, and then we'll have to get the answer from that. So each one of our threads is going to compute f of a on its chunk of the array, and then add that, that piece together, um, and then we'll collect those partial sums together to compute the global sum. So there's the logically shared data, which is the original numbers in the original ar array, and also the global sum, so consistent with the picture on the previous slide. And there's stuff that's lo lo logically private. Um, it could sit out in some kind of a shared space, but those are the temporary values from applying f to each one of the array elements and the partial sums. Okay, so there's just a little bit of pseudocode. This isn't really what the, the syntax, unfortunately, in, in C is um, a little bit uglier than this. But um, it, if you do something like fork a thread um, of, of a sum function, so I'm making up a little function here, sum, that is going to add up all the elements of an array A. And then we also, in parallel, do a sum of the other half of the elements in the array A. This is not doing the whole operation at this point. It's just doing the, the summing part of it of, um, of, an, of a single array A. And, um, and I'm, as I said, I'm kind of assuming that there's some function that's been desi de designed elsewhere, um, defined elsewhere, which is uh, um, to compute the sum of the array. And so all I'm doing here is creating two parallel threads, one of which is doing the first half, and the other is doing the second half. OK, so now let's fig think about what is happening inside of those. Um, and now I'll actually um, compute the, um, have the f um, function in here as well, which could be happening inside that sum operation. Um, and the, uh, we, we've got some variables like i th that are local. And we've got, we've, we're saying that the s is a global variable. Depending on what language we're programming in, the syntax will be a little different. That's how you would write it in C, or one way of writing it in C to make sure that it's um, visible to all of the threads. OK, so what each one of these threads is doing is they're um, both adding up the half of the elements, and they're writing them directly into the sum. So what's the problem with this program? Any ideas? You might update one of the S's. And you've already gotten the value for the S and the other, and then you don't have to log. That's right. So if they're both updating at S at the same time, it's what's called a race condition. And in particular, it can, you can lose some of the updates. So I'll go, I'll give you an, a, a, we'll go through a more detailed example of how this happens. Um, but first, the definition. So a race condition, sometimes called a data race, occurs when there's two processors or two threads that are accessing the same variable. So that's S. 
at least one of them does a write. Um, if, if they're both doing reads, it's OK, because they can both read the data and nobody really cares, so we don't call that a race. Um, but if at least one of them is writing it, then, either, then the order in which they happen is, um, will really change the behavior of the program, depending on whether the write happens before the read, or the read happens before the write, or if there's two writes, one's writing three, one's writing six, depending on what order they happen, and you'll get different program behavior. So anything that can create that kind of different program behavior is called, a, um, from that kind of a reordering, is called a race um, if there are things happening concurrently. So if the accesses are concurrent, there's no synchronization saying that you know, there's some operation in here saying, wait, everybody wait at this point for that first write to happen to be guaranteed that the read is going to happen later. Um, that wouldn't be a race if there was synchronization. But if they could happen concurrently, even if they don't happen exactly concurrently in a particular execution, the program has a race in it because they could happen concurrently. OK, so what is the, what's the bad scenario that comes from having a race like this? Well, so we have to think a little bit about the code that's being generated inside by, by the compiler and go back and remember that the compiler is actually doing loads and stores into registers to see exactly what the problem is. So let's say we have a little tiny array um, of the, the values 3 and 5. And our f function is simply to square the values in that. So we're going to compute the sum of squares of the elements of array. So thread 1 computes some value um, f of a of i. So, the, so it's computing um, 3 squared. And it puts it into a register um, r0, so re register 0. And that's the value 9, of course. Um, and there's a whole bunch of assembly code that the compiler had to generate to do this operation as well. But I'm not, I'm not showing you that because it doesn't really matter for this example. Um, let's say then the next thing that happens is thread 2. I mean, this could actually be happening at the same time. Um, but, but we could also think of it as, as an interleaving. So thread 2 now runs for a little while. And it computes its, its f of um, the second value of a. The next thing that happens is the register 1 gets written with um, we, we load the previous value of s. So let's say s started at 0 um, right at the beginning of the program. So we load an s. That's a 0 that gets put in register 1. Then um, the thread 2 also takes a step. And it reads the same value um, 0 into register s1. It then does its write. So it computes, the, it computes the sum and puts that in register 1. And it actually writes it back right away. So there's nothing in this program that says that the threads have to take turns taking steps. There's nothing that says that one thread runs faster than the other. So you can get any possible interleaving of these operations. The memory operations will be um, the way the program behaves. And the things that are sitting in registers can actually really happen in parallel um, because they're operating in completely different register sets. So then the, the 9 gets, computed, uh, it gets um, yeah, computed as the sum over on the other side because it doesn't see that 25 has already been written back to s because it read s before. Um, and then it writes back 9 into the value. And so it, of course, you get the wrong answer. So um, this, uh, th so we should be getting 34 at the end, but we can get either 34, because it, it, could, it could so happen that this read operation of s might actually happen after this write of s over there or the other way around. Um, you could get 9, because that one gets written back last, or 25, because the other side gets written back last. So you can have a bunch of different behaviors. Um, and what we're assuming in this particular execution is that the atomic operations, the smallest operations in which um, you can think of things as being interleaved, are reads and writes to memory locations. And so what that means is that um, what, we, what we don't show is a case in which you get the value 10,096 because the bits that get written out for 9 and the bits that get written out for 25 somehow get mixed together at some point when they're both, if they're both being written back simultaneously. So that's because hardware doesn't actually do that. It won't mix the bits together. It'll either write a 9 or 25 if they both are happening, if they're both being executed at the same time. One of them is going to get to the memory system first and um, will be written there, but you won't get some mixture of the bits. Okay. And the other thing is we're assuming here that these other computations are happening in the local registers. So are there questions about what this is or what happens? Yes? Uh, on the first thread, doesn't register 0 continue? In the order you described? In the order I described, because, I mean, I have to go back to the animation, but the first thing that happened is it, it computed f of a of i. Um, th this thread 1 is looking at um, the 3, so it's computing the 9. This one's looking at the 5. It uses, oh, these are different. Good question. OK, so 
thread one and thread two are running on different processors and they have different registers. So this, this register zero and that register zero are completely different register zeros and, the, and so on with the others. But yeah, very good. Good question. Any other questions? So they all have a little bit of memory, right? There are register sets that are going to be, um, that are going to be different and they, that, that, that's basically where the, the problem comes up. Okay, so we can fix this problem and we can fix it by adding synchronization. Um, we do it by adding something like a, a lock operation. And there again, I'm not going to try to go into syntax today to tell you exactly how to write this kind of lock. As, you get, as we get closer to um, the parallel programming assignment that you'll do for homework two, um, then we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what the syntax looks like. But here's um, what we've done is now to add a local a temporary variable just to make it clear what's happening. And um, we'll compute a local sum, local S sub 1. And this S1 and S2 are different. And in fact, we don't have to use different names for them for the same reason, kind of for the same register reason that I talked about before. Um, we can actually just um, we could actually just use the same S1 because those are private variables. But in any case, they're 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 different variables, so I gave them different names for this example. And now, the the critical thing is you've, you both threads have computed their partial sums. Um, we need to before we do the the lock operation. Sorry, we, before we update the shared variable s, we need to make sure that nobody else is updating it at the same time. So before I do my initial read of s, I acquire a lock. Then I can do the I acquire the lock. Then I can read s. I can uh, add the I can read this local variable, which doesn't really matter because nobody else can read it. And then I'll add them to, and do the write of s, and then do the unlock. And that guarantees that the whole um, that whole addition, the read. Called a read modify write is all being done as a single step that no other thread can see in the middle of. As at least know the thread that's calling carefully using the same locks that um, that the first one is using. Okay. Questions. Okay. So, all right. That's a way of writing a shared memory program. Can we build hardware that looks like that? Um, and yes, the answer is that's what most multi-core systems look like today, um, and even what are called SMPs or symmetric multiprocessors. Um, are also built as um, shared memory. There's a couple of different ways you can build the architecture. So for those of you who are architect no computer architecture, I'm going to just talk about one of the simple ways of doing this, um, which gives everybody a reasonable model to think about the hardware and what it's doing. So, um, and the, uh, the basic idea is we're going to have these processors. Each one of them is going to also have its own little cache. Okay? And that's going to cause some problems for us. Um, and then there's going to be a shared, what's called a bus, which is, think of it as a, as a broadcast medium. So anything that is being read, any data that is going to be read into this processor is going to have to th go through its cache. Remember, that's what the, the caches are there for, is to store values that are either about to be or are being read or um, if they've been written and before they've gone back to memory and have been thrown out. Um, so anything that crosses between this cache and actually this cache down here in the picture, which is a shared cache for all of them, is going to go over this bus. And what actually happens is all the processors listen on that bus. So they can hear, they're, they're listening for values being lo loaded into other caches, and they'll make sure that they don't have that, that address sitting in their own cache. Okay? Because if you have that, that address sitting in their own cache, then you can end up with two different values for that same memory location. And so that's, um, that's the idea of this, this bus architecture. It's called a Snoopy cache, is that they're all listening to the things going on. Um, the basic problem is you've got to make sure that you don't have two different copies of a single address in memory. And so they do that by snooping on the cache. The, the, um, the nice thing is this is a fairly easy programming model to use. People tend to like writing programs in the shared memory style. Um, and these machines give you, it gives you kind of a simple model because you actually, other than the kind of locality optimizations you're doing in matrix multiply, which are sort of really for the serial processor performance, you don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to this, the, the cache structure. You can just think of it as all the processors are connected to this memory. And so that's sort of the way it looks. They're all directly connected, and they just do loads and stores of that memory. And the hardware handles all of the messy details for you. Um, it's hard to scale these kinds of uh, these kinds of systems up. Um, Bus-based systems, you know, maybe you'll get eh, maybe a little higher than 32 cores at this point, but 32 um, different uh, sockets or pro processors was is pretty typical in terms of the maximum size. And um, the reason is because you've got this broadcast thing right here. Everybody's listening on it. It's just hard to get. Um, you, you've got a lot of traffic going on in that, and so if you have a lot of processors listening to it, then the um, the bus the shared cache and so on in the memory system become a bottleneck. 
so it, it doesn't, it's not very scalable. But it's a very popular and very common way to build machines for, for small-scale multiprocessors. Um, OK, so I mentioned the, the uh, memory bus becomes a bottleneck. The caches need to be kept coherent, as I said. And here's a little example to show um, the, the problem. This, that this is taken from a um, what's called a uh, parallel spectral transform of the shallow water model. Um, and this was a benchmark actually done by people outside of Berkeley. I think this was done by people at UC San Diego. Um, and what we're going to see here is the serial performance with one copy of the code running independently on, on different numbers of processors. So there's, this is not a parallel program. This is one serial program, and we're running um, n copies of it, and they're not doing any communication with each other. So there's nothing interesting happening from a parallelism standpoint. We're just going to see whether they run out of um, resources in terms of the memory accesses. And so what you can see from the performance, so this is megaflops per second per processor. So up is good. Um, and the, this, is the, uh, this is a horizontal resolution, so you can just think of this as different problem sizes. Um, but you'll, you can see that the one processor case, always, that is one processor running all by itself, because it's per processor here, is, runs much faster than when you have 32 processes all, all running on the 32 processors on the system. And this was run at an IBM Power um, 6 C90 experiment. But you'll see similar things today. Um, actually, it's, a, it's a, a big question as to how many processes or threads can you run on a multi-core architecture or a, an SMP architecture today and um, uh, have enough memory bandwidth to keep them running at their, the full speed that they would have run on, uh, at if they were just one, one thread. OK. So machine model number two, which is a slight variation, is um, uh, a uh, multi-threaded processor. And this is kind of like having more processors, except they're not full-fledged processors. So what you have is some th hardware thread contexts that um, are going to be just enough information to store uh, data about the thread and what, um, what the thread needs to remember where it's at in the program and so on. And, um, and there's some other shared state. But, the, um, but some of the things will, be, will, will not be um, replicated for each one of those threads. So the Sun Niagara pro processor, which was the early one, the Victoria Falls processor from Sun also, um, had, they had a line of these. Of course, now Sun is Oracle, and I'm not sure that these are moving forward. But in any case, um, they had a number of these multi-threaded architectures. Cray had a system called the MTA, and now actually the Eldorado and the XMT processors. And they, they, we, I drew these separately because they're not really full-fledged processors. So for example, they might share a floating point unit. So they, you know, whereas before, each processor would have its own floating point unit. In this case, they might be one floating point unit that they all share, um, but they'll all have their own um, load store unit so they can actually access memory uh, operations and memory in parallel. But if they have to do computation, they may have to wait for the other threads to do that. Um, and why, w why would you build a system? Anybody have an idea why you would build a multi-threaded system like this where you might share something as what seems like as important as a floating point unit, but, um, but allow them to all have their own, uh, their own load store units? Must be some computer scientist. Brian. <laughs> That's right. So thinking back to lecture one, remember we said that bandwidth, uh, that is the, the rate at which you can do things is much higher than the latency, the amount of time it takes to get things out of memory. So, so what you want to do in order to make your, run, your system run faster is do not wait for the latency of memory accesses. It's too long. So it says, well, rather than having all these, this processor hardware, which I can't actually use, I'll just replicate enough of it that they can all generate lots of load and store instructions to saturate the memory bus. So I run at memory bandwidth speed, but I don't have to put in enough floating point units because they won't have enough uh, data to actually do that anyway. They'll all be waiting for the loads and stores. And so it's a way of giving you, um, letting you increase the uh, bandwidth utilization. Um, you can also build uh, distributed shared memory machines. I think the canonical uh, example of that, and I meant to change the word, is the SGI Altix. Um, they, they now have a new system, which is the ultraviolet or UV system. Um, but the, and uh, NASA Ames has uh, always been a big uh, is a computing center um, for NASA that has always uh, really preferred these kinds of shared memory machines. And the idea is that um, they don't have a physically shared memory um, in the sense that they don't have, you, you actually are going to have multiple memory banks, any, even in a shared memory. But you have these distinct parts of memory and this network in which different parts of memory, cache lines um, or pages, are going to move 
from the memory up into the caches. And what happens is there's a more complicated algorithm in here for keep making sure that you don't have two copies of the same page in memory. And so it's kind of like the bus, except that um, and there's, there's, it's a lot more complicated to build. There's a little piece of hardware here that keeps track of all the things that are in the caches and allows the processors to make sure they don't have uh, duplicate copies of things. So this scales much larger than a bus-based architecture. Um, might scale to 512. I think they've actually built larger systems, although the, the performance at some point still tends to be problematic if you try to program the whole thing as one big um, shared memory architecture. And the, the limitation in terms of performance is the cache coherence protocol. So these are the things that are making sure that you don't have two copies of the same cache line in two different caches. You also have to make the cat, if you make the pages larger, then you don't have as many little bits of information to keep track of, but um, that can cause other problems for performance. Okay, so change, uh, uh, switch gears here. We're going to talk about the second main class of machines and um, also the, the second main programming model, which is called message passing. And in this case, the, the program is going to collect, uh, consist of a collection of named processes. It is typically the case in a message passing program that we don't dynamically create parallelism as we did in the um, shared memory case. But that's a somewhat orthogonal, but, really, but, but that's kind of the way, um, the way these languages t uh, tend to be set up. So it's, there are a fixed set of threads that program startup time. So just think of your main function, whether it's uh, Fortran C or whatever, C++, it's just being copied. So we're going to have some number of copies of that, and they don't have any shared data. And um, so the only way they communicate is by sending messages to each other. So they'll have to know how to find the other processes, so they'll have names, and they'll send messages to each other. Um, the and coordination is then implicit. Every time you communicate, you're implicitly kind of coordinating between them. Um, you can also do certain kinds of synchronization in these models. All the data then is is private, um, so there's you know we can um, have a, our cartoon has um, the data the the processors or the threads all sitting here, um, the state is all private state that's sitting here on, associated with each processor, and then there's a network that goes between the processors. Um, so you can do a send operation, for example, you send to processor one from some some variable s. And um, processor one has to also say receive, and it will receive it from processor n, and it, it receives the value s, n, and s, and hopefully you can see from that how you might get uh, a sum computed. Um, and we'll do this. We'll, we'll look at this uh, for just the two processor case. Um, you know, there again, hopefully you can you can think about generalizing it. Um, if you have more processors, some some there's different ways of, of organizing it, which we'll talk about later. But um, they'll all have to somehow send data to each other in order to get the sum computed. So here's a, a first possible um, program. We have some um, our local v value that we're going to send to um, processor two, and processor two is going to send its local value to processor one, and we're going to both do receive operations after you send your values. And then you're going to you're going to both they're both going to compute the sum, sum redundantly by adding their own local value that they've computed. This actually maybe should be the sum of the first half of the array A. I just tried to simplify the. Uh, the the uh, amount of code in the example, so you'll um, but you could you could have added up all of the stuff in the first half of the array A, and that one could be adding up all the stuff in the second half of the array, and so you add those together and um, by adding to the remote value. Okay, so send and receive can act in a couple of different ways. You can imagine that it acts like a telephone system, right? So what's the problem with the telephone is when you want to call somebody, they have to be ready to accept your call. And it could also act like the post office, so an asynchronously, where you can sort of send a message off, and at some later point, somebody can go and check their mailbox and see whether or not the data has gotten there. So assuming that it works like the telephone system, what problem do you see? What's the problem with this code? Right, so one processor, ha so a general problem is that one processor has to wait for the other one to finish. In this particular case, They've both done a send operation, okay? And if that send operation is going to wait for the other one to finish, what does it mean to finish? Well, it means wait for the other processor to get to the receive operation. But what is the other processor doing? The other processor is waiting for you to do the receive operation. So this is called a deadlock, and the problem is that um, you're both waiting for the other one to, um, to do the receive operation. And so this program, if you're using what's called a synchronous message passing style, is going to just halt, is going to just um, stop at that point when both of them have done their send operations, neither one can execute the receive because they have to wait for the send to complete, and they just get stuck, okay? and your program will hang. Um, and there are ways in these message passing models like MPI to use an, an asynchronous kind of message passing where you don't have this 
um, this uh, particular order. If you, do if you do have this constraint that you're running a synchronous message passing, you can fix this particular example by reversing the order and saying processor 2 is going to receive first and then send, um, and that will make this program then run correctly, even in a synchronous communication model. Um, but typically, we're going to want to use something that doesn't deadlock quite so easily, so we may use a, an asynchronous model. Um, and if there are more than two processors, you can imagine that um, fixing this problem becomes a little bit more complicated. You have to now figure out you know, who's talking to whom. That's one of the problems that comes up with multiple processors, but then also who's going to go first in terms of the sending and the receiving. Okay, so um, MPI, the message passing interface, is really the de facto standard for writing large-scale parallel applications independently of the hardware that you're running on. And it has become the de facto standard in part because it is, um, because it is a standard. Um, and actually, at the time that it was designed, a lot of people had been writing message passing programs in a lot of different libraries. Um, the, the chemistry community had their own library, and the computer science community had their own. And there were actually, I think, dozens of these different communication libraries. And the community got together and said, well, let's just define one so that send and receive are spelled the same way, and they have kind of the basic arguments. Um, and so the MP MPI standard, we, people call it the least common denominator, um, which is that it's, it's kind of encoding what the way we were building machines in the mid-'80s, and so it can make it hard for hardware ar architectures to actually try to make the machines look any different because if you say, well, I can make a shared memory program run much faster, you say, but that's okay, I'm going to just write a message passing program on top of it anyway, so none of the extra hardware so stuff that you put into your system actually matters. So the, the tr truth is that the programming models have reflected the hardware, and now that we're getting lots of multi-core chips on a single node, I think it, it will also um, reflect the hardware. So Horst Simon, who has um, team taught this class before, said, I'm not sure how I will program a petaflops computer, but I'm sure that it will need MPI somewhere. Uh, actually, we can change that with uh, exaflops. In fact, I thought I um, had done that. So we are using, certainly using MPI today in petaflops, but he said this in 2001 and, of course, was, uh, was right. So MPI is a very popular model. At NERSC, MPI is by far the most popular programming model used um, by any of our application developers. <coughs> Okay, um, so that was the programming model, this little send and receive, a bunch of other stuff in MPI. In fact, it's a very thick interface. There's a lot of things we'll talk about in MPI. We won't actually cover all of them in lecture, but um, you will get to uh, try parts of MPI in your homework assignments, and depending on what you do with your final project, um, probably use more of it there. So, um, but what does the machine architecture look like underneath that implements this? Well, it looks very close to the cartoon that we had for the programming model. There's lots of different systems. So PC clusters, also called Beowulf clusters, have this kind of a structure, as well as a lot of supercomputers like the Franklin system and the Hopper system that you'll be using in this class. And um, each processor has its own memory um, and, and its own caches, which I haven't even shown here in the picture. And then it has a little network interface that talks to the network, which talks to the other processors. Okay. So here's a picture of Thomas Sterling, who was um, a, uh, coined the term Beowulf cluster and really popularized the idea of, al along with other people, including the Berkeley Now um, community, uh, building these uh, kinds of clusters out of PCs. And it was really an experiment in uh, parallel computing, and it, but it kind of it really pushed the, the market and the, the commu computing community in a very um, important direction, which was to make parallel processing cheap. Right, because anybody could go out and buy a little cluster of PCs, maybe 16 of them, and hook them together with some kind of a network, and then they could write MPI applications. That was the standard, um, and it uh, um, and it then when they once they had their MPI applications, they could then take it if they wanted to to a supercomputing center and probably run it on a larger scale system. Okay, so. Um, so there's a lot of different, um, a, a lot of the systems on the top 500 list that I talked about before, um, in fact, about 82% of them are clusters today. Um, and it depends on how you count, count them. Most of the others, even if they're um, supercomputers, have this kind of a cluster architecture. Um, just to give you an idea of, the, of an example of this, the IBM cell cluster at Los Alamos, which was, it used to be number two, it has since dropped down from that, is built out of these um, PlayStation 3 or cell processor chips with AMD processors on it and has a total, if you count each one of those S, uh, SPEs inside of the cell chip, has a total of 129,000 um, processor cores. Okay, so 
Besides building clusters, whether they're built with really high performance networks as in supercomputers or they're built out of Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet networks, for example, or built out of InfiniBand, um, there's, there are other ways in which we can build um, computers. And I think we we'll probably, probably don't have a lecture for this plan this semester, although we have at times, and we could, um, it is to look at what is called um, volunteer computing, somewhat related to kind of grid computing, which is what about just harnessing all the cycles that are out there in the world and everybody's laptops and PCs as opposed to going off and building a computing center. And so this is actually used today. Um, there's a, there, the, the project is called SETI. I think, is there somebody in this class that's involved with SETI? Jim, did you mention that? Oh, your CSCS, yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> Jim's teaching another class, and he mentioned to me there's somebody. Okay, so I think um, so. SETI is, is um, for allowing you to write these applications that get spread out over a whole bunch of machines. And in fact, you can download a screensaver if you want, and it will run SETI applications. And you won't really know exactly what it's doing. You'll just know that it's using your compute cycles um, on your on your system. Hopefully, when you're not using them. So this was a um, this is a model that makes a lot of sense if. Um, Hardware is expensive, and you're trying to save the cost of hardware by using basically everybody else's hardware. Um, once the it, parents realize that their kids are running SETI at home on their PlayStations, um, which it does, by the way, run on PlayStations, um, and that their electrical bill is going to be three times higher than they thought it would have been, than, that would have been, uh, people may, the, the model becomes a little bit more problematic. But in any case, there are a lot of sort of free cycles, modulo electricity, uh, to be harnessed. And it is used for real data sets. Um, this is looking at radio telescope data um, that is running on uh, SETI at home. And they have plans to the next um, version of the telescope array. And it's also used for think, projects like folding at home, for protein folding. And um, there's just sort of general uh, infrastructure for doing a lot of different kind of at-home applications. OK, slight variation. And I don't really call it its own programming model because it's sort of in between shared memory and message passing, but it's really designed to work on the same kind of hardware as message passing is what we call a global address space model. And in this case, um, as in the, um, it's, it's sort of, it, it is sort of a mixture of um, shared memory and message passing. So you have a set of named threads as in message passing. And you can, um, and normally, in, in most of these models, uh, at least the older ones, it, the number of threads is fixed at program startup time. And um, there's some locally shared data, but there's also so local um, data, and there's also shared data, as in the shared memory model. But the difference is, the difference between shared memory is, first of all, you have a fixed set of, th of threads at program startup time. Those are going to be aligned with physical memories, that is, a processor with its physical memory associated with it. And th therefore, the memory is going to be logically partitioned. That is, I can read and write, as any thread can read and write any variable that's in shared memory, but the variables that are nearby in this kind of piece of the machine are going to be much faster to access than data that's over here. And the reason is because if I read and write data over there, it's going to actually send a, net, a message out through the network. So a couple of projects at Berkeley, the UPC project that I've worked on for many years, also a, a Lawrence Berkeley Lab project, um, and Titanium, which is a Java-based language. Um, and then there's a version of Fortran called Coalray Fortran, which has, by the way, recently been adopted into the Fortran standard. So some of this partition global address space stuff is actually now in the, in the Fortran standard. We're trying to get the C stuff into the GCC standard trunk, not yet into the ISO C spec. But um, these languages are being picked up um, as, a, um, in, in, as kind of part of the general um, languages. So, it's, a, it's this intermediate point, and what it does is it gives you some of the convenience of writing shared memory programs without, um, so you don't have to say send and receive, um, but it still gives you kind of the performance model of message passing, that is, mostly work on local data, and if you need to, go off and get something that's remote. Um, there, are, there were also a number of systems that were built specifically with global address-based hardware in them. They look a lot like um, message passing hardware. In fact, they, the picture is identical um, to, to message passing hardware. These are systems like the Cray T3D and T3E. Um, the X1, arguably the Hopper 2 system, which has a Gemini interconnect in it, has, um, has some of this kind of support. And the difference is uh, what you really need is what was called RDMA or um, remote uh, direct memory access hardware support that's in the network interface. So what does this mean? Um, it means that this network interface can directly read and write to memory without talking to the processor. So I should probably write, draw a little line actually in there to memory as well as to the processor. And so, um, so the idea is that um, if you do a, a, a remote read operation, the processor 
sends that remote read operation out in the network, let's say it comes over here, and it doesn't have to talk to the program on that side for a receive operation, the network interface just re directly reads that out of memory and sends it back. So we also call this a one-sided communication model because there's no matching receive. There's just kind of a put or get operation as opposed to a matching send and receive model. And um, so that's, that's the, um, kind of the, the hardware architecture. And um, what's important in terms of hardware support is whether the network interface can access memory without, um, without going out, in, without contacting the processor and without interrupting the program that's on that, um, that's, that's running the user's program on that's where they, there, there would have to be a receive operation. So you don't have to have the receives. And I think the other um, piece of it is, what was I going to say, um, I think I lost my turn of thought. They, the, um, Right, so, so a lot of hardware, even things like InfiniBand um, networks, have this kind of RDMA support, which gives you um, higher performance. Right, I know what I was going to say. Of course, these processors have caches and so on, that memory hierarchy that we've seen in all the other pictures that are not really elucidated here. That was not a problem in message passing because those caches were only caching values that were inside of this memory, and so there was never a chance that there would be two copies of the same address inside of different caches. And that's the same rule that's used here, which is a, an address that you get from across the machine will come in here into the network interface and can go into memory, but it doesn't go into that processor's cache. Okay? And you need a little bit more hardware to support to make this work, but that's, that's the basic trick, um, which is you, you don't have to do this global, you don't have this, this global cache coherence problem of keeping all the caches consistent. So it's easier to get these machines and um, to, to scale. The downside is, if I were writing kind of real shared memory style code, if I access the same variable twice, the second one's going to be really fast because it's sitting in my cache, um, if that, even if that variable came from across the network. In this model, it's not going to be sitting in the cache unless it came from your local memory. So accessing far away variables uh, multiple times in a row is going to be very slow. So as a programmer, you're going to want to make a local copy of them if you're going to do that. So that, that, that turns it into something that looks a little bit more like message passing, but it does have some of the aspects of shared memory. Okay, the last um, programming model I want to talk about, and um, I think Jim will talk a little bit more about this in the, um, when he's talking about um, the uh, uh, sources of parallelism, and we'll see some of the um, different ways in which you use kind of tree-based computations in a data parallel programming model. So what's the idea of a data parallel model in, in its kind of purest form, which is there's just a single thread of control. Okay, so there's just one instruction stream, and there's a whole bunch of processors um, and those processors are going to execute exactly the same instruction at exactly the same time. In both of our other models, even if you've got the same main function, they're going down different branches, they're doing whatever. In this one, they're going to just be kept aligned at the same, um, the same point in the program. So that's kind of the way to think about the hardware. Um, you can run it on other kind of hardware, but it's, it's the way to think about the program. So we've got a sequential program that has a set of statements. So a is the array of all the data. If I say f a is a new array, which is equal to f of a, that's a perfectly valid assignment statement in a data parallel language. I have to somehow declare my array f a. And so that f a array is now a new array that by just saying f of a gets, all the elements of it get assigned simultaneously. And the hardware um, may, you know, will pick those up and do them in parallel. And then if I say sum, well, the sum also has to be something that is understood by the compiler and the hardware. But basically, in a data parallel language, you'll, you'll, you can take something like a sum operation and um, combine all of the values from an array into a single value. And they, the um, compiler will know and the hardware will know how to execute that. So um, this is a very elegant uh, computation style. As I said, Jim will tell you more about some of the clever um, things that you can do. This is going to be, we're gonna, when we do a sum operation, I'll give you one little hint, which is that um, we'll do it as a tree-based computation. So you'll add these two together and these two and so on. And then you'll have half as many elements, and then you'll add things together. And so you'll get in um, log steps, you'll get the uh, sum of that, um, sum of that array computed. So um, a lot of really, really nice algorithms, which by the way, people are either reinventing or hopefully rediscovering uh, by looking at the old papers that were written on these SIMD architectures or vector architectures, both of which are doing data parallel operations uh, for GPUs. Because as I mentioned, GPUs have these data parallel operations in them, and at least that's the way they execute the best. And so um, people are going back and looking at these algorithms. So what are the drawbacks of this data parallel model, given that I said it's really elegant? So you don't have to worry about data races. Everything just kind of happening sequentially. The basic, uh, biggest downside is that not all computational problems fit into the data parallel model. 
And certainly not unless you nest the data parallelism together, because you're going to have some coarser parallelism, some fine-grained parallelism inside of arrays. And I, I would say the thing that kind of killed them off in terms of popularity, they were very popular when people used to build hardware this way, um, which were these SIMD hardware. And um, there were languages like Star Lisp, uh, a data parallel version of Lisp, and uh, I'm trying to remember the, the uh, connection machine, Fortran, CMF. Um, and other languages like that. But when the Beowulf cluster phenomenon hit, um, people said, okay, well, we have these data parallel applications. Can't we just compile them onto these, these clusters? And then what does the compiler have to do? It basically has to do the problem that we talked about at the beginning of lecture. It has to say, oh, here's a big array. Here's another big array that's going to be the answer. I need to chop this into pieces, give each, each piece to a different processor, and then compute the sum by computing a local sum, and then, result, uh, then producing the answer to, um, by combining them together. For a really simple problem like that, the compilers were able to do it. But for a lot of real parallel applications, it became very hard. And, uh, and basically, I think you can, you can argue about whether it was too hard a problem or the community just lost patience with the compiler writers. But in any case, um, they kind of gave up on that class of languages. Uh, but they may come back now with, with things like GPUs. Um, uh, the, the hardware model that goes with this is um, hopefully uh, is sort of what you might think. Um, it would look like, which is a bunch of little tiny processors. Um, these, in some cases, were actually bit processors. But um, if you think of these as little tiny processors, one of them working on each one of the elements of memory, they have their own memory. They have some interconnect together. But they're, um, there's actually a single control processor that's controlling what all of them do. So they don't go off and do their own thing. There's no possibility that one's going to read while the other one's writing. They're issuing instructions that say, everybody add you know, compute. Uh, uh, you know, a sub i times 2 or whatever. And so there were machines like the MassPAR, the Connection Machine 2, um, and some of the that, that um, had been, been built with this kind of uh, SIMD architecture. Um, and they basically got killed off in the marketplace by things like Beowulf clusters because they were doing their own custom processor designs for each one of these processors. And whereas the clusters of PCs were just using whatever Intel and IBM and HP and so on were designing at the time, and they could just um, they, they could build those systems much less expensively. Um, vector machines are also based on this kind of a single, uh, are, are actually based on a single processor model, although you can build clusters of vector machines. Also, they have, um, they have these multiple functional units, and they're all performing the same operation. But it's a little different than a SIMD architecture in that they're not really full processors out there, but they, they look very similar. Um, they're called vector lanes or um, pipes. and um, there, but the, the difference tends to be that you'll load a set of values into a vector register, which might have, say, 64 elements long. And the hardware isn't going to actually have enough processors to execute on all of those. It'll, um, it'll have a vector length. Uh, well, actually, the vector length may be 64. So if you have uh, a vector with 1,000 elements, it'll load the first 64, do operations on that, and then load the next 64, and so on. Probably the most recent large-scale vector machine uh, was the Earth Simulator. And it was a machine from NEC. It was the top machine in the world in the top 500 list for, uh, I think, about two and a half years, something like that. So it, it, was, it kind of leapfrogged over other um, systems and was a very fast, also very, very expensive machine, um, hundreds of millions of dollars um, to build that machine, both the R&D and the, the cost of the actual hardware. Um, the Cray X1 and X1E were also um, uh, vector machines around the same time, and, and um, those machines, there again, it became just impossible to, uh, to afford to, to design those machines. And so now these SSC instructions, which you will get to play with in Homework 1, are, have shown up in all of these microprocessor instruction sets. And um, as I said, we're also seeing the, this idea in GPUs. Um, there's a little bit about vector processors. I guess I, I kind of waved my hands about it before. But the basic idea, if we want to perform something like an add operation, the compiler will chop this 1,000 element add operation up into a bunch of 64 element adds. So it loads, say, 64 elements of array 1 into vector register 1, which is this big wide thing, and another vector register 2, which is a big wide thing, and will produce another wide vector as the output, performing it with a single instruction, which is a single add instruction, a single vector add instruction. And it'll, it'll, it'll get all of the values out um, in that one register. Now, this add operation may not take a single cycle. In fact, if it's a 64 element vector, it'll probably take uh, several cycles, because the hardware will not have enough floating point units to do them all at once. It'll do a, a chunk of them, maybe eight of them at a time, and, but it'll fill it in. But from the, from the programming standpoint, it just looks like one vector instruction. And um, so these. Um, 
And uh, yeah, this is just talking about how the, uh, they, they get chopped up into these um, elements, the vector elements by the compiler. OK, so there's a couple pictures of some of the vector architectures. That's the, the uh, insides of the Cray X1 and the, uh, um, the, uh, the outside the cabinets for the Cray X1. And um, a little bit more, they had uh, four processor nodes sharing 64 gigabytes of memory and um, a single system of up to uh, 4,000 of these processors. And they also had this hardware support for um, these DMA, remote D RDMA operations, which was actually even, even faster than that. You could actually load and store directly from a register all the way out to memory that was sitting on another processor. So it was actually built into the processor architecture as well. So advantages and disadvantages of that really nice programming model. You can do loads and stores um, directly from the registers. Uh, the disadvantage is that somebody's got to go design that processor because that processor is not the kind of processor that's being used in laptops or PCs or game stations or anything else. And so um, basically what happened is the processors became so slow that they, they just couldn't keep up from a design standpoint because a small company like Cray um, or even NEC, which has a narrow market, just doesn't have the resources to build um, for processors, and th there's just not enough big enough market to, to um, justify it. So, yes? So I assume all these applications are like written in Fortran and a vectorized, like the vectorizing compiler right. is very, very good for these machines versus other things that have been you know, less than spectacular. Right? right, so these, yeah, vectorizing compilers worked great on these hard, this hardware, and, um, and I would say that. Um, People who programmed these machines really liked vectorizing compilers because they, even though you would sometimes have to change your code, kind of the way we're going to talk about changing it for caches, you could you kind of get a mental model of what it was going to do. So you could think of it as, oh, it's just going to have these big, wide operations, even though that wasn't exactly the hardware and programmed to it. You got feedback why it wasn't being vectorized. Right. Yeah, the, the, the compiler would immediately give you, you know, when you'd compile your program and say, that loop right there didn't vectorize because there's an assignment statement right there that looks like it's got a problem, it's got a dependence in it, and then you'd say, oh, I think I can fix that. So, right. Um, there's a little picture of the Earth simulator. I ju I'll just end by saying that there are, of course, hybrids of these, um, all of these different programming models and all the different machine architectures. The most, the typical play, the uh, idea is to have message passing, distributed memory in the hardware. Message passing is the programming model at the top level, and um, shared memory inside of that, a multi-core or just SMP symmetric multiprocessor nodes. Although Building them with GPUs is also going to be uh, is, is also very popular, as we saw from the top 500 list. There is um, a global address, set of global address-based languages um, that came out of a project called the HPCS project from DARPA that um, have used this idea of a global address space that kind of gives you a mixture of shared and distributed memory, but um, for a more general kind of dynamically threaded model. And um, you can also use this kind of a global address space in a hybrid hybrid programming model. So the, the nice thing about the global address space also, you can tell it's my own research area, is that it, it allows you to really execute well on shared memory and on distributed memory as long as you have this networking support. Um, I think I won't uh, talk any more about that. Just to say, um, as I said, machines today are, tend to be built out of these hybrid components. And you should hopefully have learned enough about shared memory and distributed memory and data parallelism to get a sense of how um, how you would write simple programs in those models, like the um, little sum of, of um, F of A sort of example that we looked at. And when Jim talks about some of the other, um, the other examples, he'll talk probably easiest to think mostly about distributed memory, because we'll talk about how you break the problem into pieces, um, a little bit about data parallelism. And um, you know, all of these machines rely on dividing up the work into parts that are mostly independent, so they don't synchronize too often, and have good locality, so there's not com much communication between them. And that's really the theme of the next two lectures, is how to do that for application problems that hopefully um, some of you will find some familiarity in some of them. Okay. Any questions, final questions? OK, Jim. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Back in the usual room. <laughs>